Hello class. This week we will be covering chapter 18, the plants and fungi in the Essentials of Biology textbook, 6th edition. So the first section we're going to cover is section 18.1, which is going to cover an overview of plants. Upon completion of this section, you should be able to describe the similarities and differences between green algae and land plants list the significant events in the evolution of land plants, and describe the alternation of generations in the life cycle of plants. So plants in the kingdom plantae are multicellular photosynthetic eukaryotes. Although plants are well adapted to a land environment, the evolutionary history of plants began in the water. Evidence indicates that plants evolved from a form of fresh water green algae some 500 million years ago. Green algae are members of the same eukaryotic supergroup as plants, the archaeoplasids, and thus share some characteristics with plants. For example, green algae contain chlorophyll A and B, as well as various accessory pigments. They also store excess carbohydrates at starts, just like plants, and they also have cellulose in their cell walls, just like plants. A comparison of DNA and RNA-based sequences suggests that land plants are most closely related to a group of freshwater green algae known as caraphytes. Molecular scientists tell us that the ancestor of land plants were most closely related to the caraphytes depicted here. Although the common ancestor of modern caraphytes and land plants no longer exist, if it ever did, it would have features resembling members of the genera Cara and Caliochete. So here's Cara, and this is Caliochete. Let's take a look at some of these filamentous green algae. So those in the genus Cara are known as stone warts because they are encrusted with calcium carbonate deposits. The body consists of a single file of long cells anchored in the mud by thin filaments, as you can see here. Whirls of branches occur in regions called nodes, and located between, and these nodes are located between the cells of the main axis. Male and female reproductive structures grow at these nodes. A caliochete looks like a pancake, but the body is actually composed of long branched filaments of cells. Most important to the evolution of plants, the reproduction of caraphytes involves a protection of their zygote from the environment. Land Plants not only protect the zygote, but also protect and nourish the resulting embryo. And that is an important feature that separates land plants from green algae. <clears throat> so let's kind of walk through the main evolutionary steps that characterize plants. So over their evolutionary history, plants have become well adapted to a land existence. Although a land environment offers advantages, such as plentiful light, it also has challenges, such as the constant threat of drying out or desiccation. Most importantly, all stages of reproduction, gametes, zygote, and embryo must be protected from the drying effect of air. To keep the internal environment of cells moist, a land plant must acquire water and transport it to all parts of the body, while keeping the body in an erect position. We will see how plants have adapted to these problems by evolving an internal vascular system. <clears throat> so let's walk through the steps that allow for the evolution of our current understanding of plants. So mosses represent the closest plant link between green algae and the remainder of the plant kingdom. Mosses are low-lying plants that generally lack vascular tissue and therefore have no means of transporting water, but they do have the means to prevent the plant body from drying out, and they protect the embryo within a special structure. 
The lycophytes, which evolved around 420 million years ago, were among the first plants to have a vascular system that transports water and solutes from the roots to the leaves of the plant body. Plants with vascular tissue have true roots, stems, and leaves. The leaves of lycophytes, called microphylls, are very narrow. Ferns are well-known plants with large leaves called megaphylls. The evolution of branching and leaves allowed a plant to increase the amount of exposure to sunlight, thus increasing photosynthesis and the production of sugars. Without adequate food production, a plant can't increase in size. The next evolutionary event was the evolution of seeds. A seed contains an embryo and stored organic nutrients within a protective coat. Seeds are highly resistant structures, well suited to protecting the plant embryo from drying out until conditions are favorable for germination. The gymnosperms were the first seed plants to appear around 360 million years ago. And the final evolutionary event of interest to us is the evolution of the flower, which is a reproductive structure found in angiosperms. Flowers attract pollinators, such as insects, and they give rise to fruits that cover seeds. Plants with flowers evolved between 120 and 140 million years ago. So in this part of the lecture, we will use the angiosperms as our model organism for the discussion of many aspects of plant biology. Okay, so here is just a visual representation of the evolution of land plants. So again, the land plants arose from a common uh, algae ancestor. Okay, and then the evolution of land plants is marked by those five significant events. First, they had the protection of the embryo, so that includes mosses, lycophytes, ferns, gymnosperms, and angiosperms all have this feature. And then the next step is that vascular tissue. Okay, so mosses lack that vascular tissue, but then we have uh, vascular tissue appearing in first lycophytes and ferns. And then from there, we have the branching of leaves. Uh, so you'll see uh, microphylls and megaphylls, um, and those leaves provide more access and more surface area for photosynthesis to take place, because remember that photosynthesis takes place in leaves. And then the next evolutionary step is the production of that seed. So that is only seen in gymnosperms and angiosperms. And then finally, the last major evolutionary step in the history of plants is the evolution of that flower. And only flowering plants have this feature, and that includes all angiosperms. So let's talk a little bit about the life cycle of plants. So the life cycle of land plants is quite different from that of animals. Unlike humans and other animals, which exhibit a diploid life cycle, all plants have a life cycle that features an alternation of generations. In a plant's life cycle, two multicellular individuals alternate, each producing the other. The two individuals are a sporophyte, which represents the diploid generation. So remember that diploid means two N, or two copies of each chromosome. And then the other is a gametophyte, which represents the haploid or N generation. So that means that the gametophyte only has one copy of every chromosome. So the sporophyte is the structure that produces spores by meiosis. A spore is a haploid reproductive cell that develops into a new organism without needing to fuse with another reproductive cell. In the plant life cycle, a spore undergoes mitosis and becomes a gametophyte. The gametophyte is named because of its role in the production of gametes. A, in plants, eggs and sperm are produced by mitotic cell division. A sperm and egg fuse, forming a diploid zygote that undergoes mitosis and becomes the sporophyte. There are two important aspects of the plant life cycle. First, in plants, meiosis produces those haploid spores, and this is consistent with the realization that the sporophyte is the diploid generation and spores are haploid. 
Second, mitosis is involved in the production of the gametes during the gametophyte generation. So let's look at a visual representation of the life cycle of plants. So here, <clears throat> we want to start with fertilization of two gametes. So upon fertilization of two gametes, we're going to produce that diploid zygote. And through the process of mitosis, it's going to produce an organism with diploid cells. And that diploid organism is the sporophyte. Okay. Within the sporophyte, there's going to be a structure called the sporangium. And the sporangium is responsible for producing the spores. The spores are produced via the process of meiosis. Okay. So once these spores are made through the process of meiosis, they'll be released by the sporophyte. And so then we're going to have a bunch of spores okay, that are now haploid because they went through meiosis. And then through the process of mitosis, these spores are going to become a multicellular organism called the gametophyte. Okay. And then through the process of mitosis again, the gametophyte is going to produce those haploid gametes. And then once those gametes are made, they will eventually fuse through the process of fertilization to once again create that zygote, which is a diploid organism. So there is one organism that is fully diploid in part of the life, uh, life cycle of a plant, and then there is one organism that is fully haploid and is part of the life cycle of the plant. And this is where we get this idea of generations alternating between being in a diploid state and being in a haploid state. So let's talk a little bit about the idea of what we call the dominant generation. So in the plant life cycle, one of the two alternating generations acts as the dominant generation. The dominant generation carries out the majority of photosynthesis. However, the major groups of plants differ as to which generation is the dominant one. In the mosses or the non-vascular plants, the gametophyte is dominant. But in the other three groups of plants, the sporophyte is dominant. This is important because in the history of plants, only the sporophyte evolved to vascular tissue. Therefore, the shift to sporophyte dominance is an adaptation to life on land. So let's talk a little bit about this image here. So notice that as the sporophyte becomes dominant, the gametophyte becomes smaller and smaller and dependent upon the sporophyte, okay? So in mosses, which are right here, the gametophyte is much larger than the sporophyte, which is right here. So this is the gametophyte structure here, and this is the sporophyte structure in mosses. In lycophytes and ferns, which are located here, the gametophyte is small, okay? So it is just a small uh, individual right here. And it is an independent structure of the sporophyte, which is not the case for mosses, okay? <clears throat> and then here in the gymnosperms, the female gametophyte of cone-bearing plants, again, which are the uh, gymnosperms, as well as in flowering plants, which are the angiosperms, is microscopic. Okay, so both of these. It is retained within the body of the sporophyte plant. This protects the female gametophyte from drying out. Also, the male gametophyte of seed plants lies within a pollen grain, and pollen grains have strong protective walls and are transported by wind insects and birds to reach the egg. In the life cycle of seed plants, the spores, the gametes, and the zygote are protected from drying out in the land environment. Okay, so that concludes section 18.1. So let us go ahead and jump into section 18.2, the diversity of land plants. So upon completion of this section, you should be able to characterize and give examples of the various groups of plants, describe the life cycle and reproductive strategy of each group of plants, 
and summarize the economic and ecological significance of plants. So to start off with, plants can be grouped into two general categories, non-vascular and vascular. Non-vascular plants receive water and nutrients through diffusion and osmosis directly into the plant body. To do this, the plant needs to stay wet as well as remain very short. The small size allows for diffusion to take place over a shorter difference and thus be more efficient. Vascular plants, on the other hand, have an internal transport system that facilitates the movement of water and nutrients through the body. This allows the plant to not only live in drier conditions, but also for an increase in height to maximize photosynthesis. So let's focus our attention first on non-vascular plants. So non-vascular plants include the liverworts, hornworts, and mosses. Collectively, they are often called the bryophytes. Bryophytes, in general, do not have true roots, stems, and leaves, all of which, by definition, contained well-developed vascular tissue. Also, in bryophytes, unlike other plants, the gametophyte is the dominant generation. The most familiar bryophytes are the liverworts and mosses, which are both low-lying plants. In bryophytes, the gametophyte is the green leafy part, which produces the gametes. The gametophyte stage of a bryophyte is completely dependent on water for reproduction. So flagellated sperm swim in a film of water to reach an egg. After a sperm fertilizes an egg, the resulting zygote becomes an embryo that develops into a sporophyte. The sporophyte is attached to and derives its nutrition from the photosynthetic gametophyte. The sporophyte produces spores in a structure called a sporangium. The spores are released into the air where they can be dispersed by the wind an adaptation to life on land. The spores will germinate if they land in moist surroundings. And upon germination, male and female gametophytes will develop. The common name of several organisms implies that they are mosses when in fact they are not. Irish moss is an edible red algae that grows in leathery tufts along the northern seacoast. Reindeer moss is actually a lichen and is the dietary mainstay of reindeer and caribou in northern lands. Club mosses will be discussed later in the, the lecture, and those are actually vascular plants. And Spanish moss, which hangs in grayish clusters from trees in the southeastern United States and Central America is actually a flowering plant uh, of the pineapple family. So when we are talking about bryophytes, we are primarily talking about our mosses, which are seen here, liverworts, and hornworts, which are seen here. So remember that when we are thinking of the bryophyte, the gametophyte is the dominant stage. So these mosses, all of this leafy green um, structures down here are the gametophytes and all of these little sproutist structures up here are the sporophyte. The sporophyte in this case is completely dependent on the nutrition derived from the gametophyte. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about some adaptations and uses for bryophytes. So the lack of well-developed vascular tissue and the presence of swimming sperm largely account for the short height of bryophytes, such as mosses. Still, mosses can be found from the Antarctic through the tropics into parts of um, the Arctic Circle. Although most mosses prefer damp, shaded locations in the temperate zone, some survive in deserts and some inhabit bogs and streams. In forests, they frequently form a mat that covers the ground and rotting logs. In dry environments, they may become shriveled, turn brown, and look dead. 
However, as soon as it rains, the plant becomes green and resumes its metabolic activity. Mosses are much better than flowering plants at living on stone walls, on fences, and in shady cracks of hot, exposed rocks. When bryophytes colonize bare rock, the rock is degraded to soil that they can use for their own growth and that other organisms can use also. <clears throat> In areas such as bogs, where the ground is wet and acidic, dead mosses, especially those of the genus uh, Phagenium, do not decay. The accumulated moss, called peat or bog moss, can be used as fuel. Peat moss is also commercially important in other ways. Because it has special non-living cells that can't absorb moisture, peat moss is often used in gardens to improve the water holding capacity of the soil. In addition, uh, spadium moss has antiseptic qualities and is used as bandages in World War II when medics ran out of traditional bandages. Okay, so that covers information related to non-vascular plants, so let's jump into the other major category, which is our vascular plants. So all the other plants we will study are vascular plants. And again, vascular plants have vascular tissue, and vascular tissue con is consistent of xylem, which conducts water and minerals up from the roots, and phloem, which conducts organic solutes such as sucrose from one part of the plant to another. The walls of conducting cells in xylem are strengthened by ligand, an organic compound that makes them stronger and more waterproof, as well as resistant to attack by parasites and predators. Only because of strong cell walls and vascular tissues can plants reach such great heights as we see today. The vascular plants usually have true roots, stems, and leaves. The roots absorb water from the soil and the stem conducts water to the leaves. The leaves are fully covered by a waxy cuticle, except where it is interrupted by stomata, which are little pores that allow for gas exchange between the atmosphere and the plant tissue. The opening and closing of the stomata is what regulates the amount of water loss in the plant. So let's focus our attention first on seedless vascular plants. So certain vascular plants, um, such as lycophytes and ferns, are what we call seedless. The other two groups of vascular plants, both gymnosperms and angiosperms, are seed plants. So in seedless vascular plants, the dominant sporophyte produces windblown spores, and the independent gametophyte produces flagellated sperm that require outside moisture to swim to an egg. So let's focus our attention first on lycophytes. So lycophytes, also called club mosses, were among the first land plants to have vascular tissue. Unlike true mosses or bryophytes, the lycophytes have well-developed vascular tissue in roots, stems, and leaves. Typically, a fleshly underground and horizontal stem called a rhizome sends up upright aerial stems. Tightly packed, these scale-like leaves will, are going to cover the stems and branches, giving the plant a mossy look. The small leaves, which are called microphylls, each have a single vein composed of xylem and phloem. The sporangia are born on terminal clusters of leaves, which are typically club-shaped. The spores are sometimes harvested and sold as lycopodium powder or vegetable sulfur, and it is used in pharmaceuticals and in fireworks because it is highly flammable. The lycopodium is a 
common moist woodland is common in moist woodlands in temperate climates where it is called ground pine. It is also abundant in the tropics as well as the subtropics. So here is an example of the lycopodium, which is a type of club moss. So again, it is a club moss because it has vascular tissue and it also has true roots. It also has a true stem and it does have leaves. And in this case, lycophytes have the microfill leaves, okay? So here we have the blown up version of the sporangium and the spores are produced in these um, organs of the sporangium, okay? And then we also have a depiction of the leaf and you can see right here that it does have a very basic vascular structure within the leaf, allowing it to be a um, plant that is a true vascular plant. And within the leaf, you can see parts of the xylem and phloem in different colors here. Okay. And then down here, we can see the different colors blown up a little bit also in the root. And the phloem is depicted as blue and the xylem is depicted as red. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about ferns. So ferns are a widespread group of plants that are well known for their attractiveness. Unlike lycophytes, ferns have megaphils or large leaves with branching veins. Megaphils provide a large surface area for capturing the sunlight needed for further synthesis and the veins conduct water and minerals throughout the leaf tissue. Ferns and other plants with megophils are better able to produce food and thus can grow and reproduce more efficiently than plants with microphils. Fern megophils are also called fronds. The leather leaf fern has fronds that are broad with subdivided leaflets and the fronds of a tree fern can be about 1.4 meters long. And those of the Hertz tongue fern are strap-like and leathery. The sporangia are often located in clusters called sori and they are located on the underside of the fronds. So here we have a couple of examples of ferns and I remember that ferns are just another type of vascular plant and they do not have seeds for reproduction. They have the spores that are produced in the sporangia and those sporangia are the sori on the other side of the leaf. And then in ferns, the gametophyte is a very small separate individual that is not found on these large megaphils, okay? <clears throat> All right, so let's talk a little bit about the fern life cycle. So the life cycle of a typical temperate fern is shown in this particular figure. The dominant spor sporophyte is going to produce those windblown spores. Okay, so here is the sporophyte and then on each of the fronds you have leaflets and on the leaflets on the underside of the leaflets, you're going to have the sorus, which is singular for sori. And then that sorus is going to contain the sporangium tissue that is going to produce the spores. Okay. And then the spores will be produced by the process of meiosis. From there, once the spores are released and land in a favorable environment, the spore is going to begin to germinate. And this germination is going to allow a individual gametophyte to grow through the process of mitosis. Okay. And then from there, the gametophyte is going to have two separate tissues that are going to produce the egg and the sperm. 
the archegonium is the special structure that produces the egg in a gametophyte, and the antheridium is the special structure in the gametophyte that produces the sperm. Okay. Now, once egg and sperm are released, the sperm are flagellated and must migrate to the egg. This is where that moisture is still required for our ferns. Okay. And then once fertilization takes place, we're going to have a diploid zygote again. And that zygote is going to germinate and produce a diploid individual, the sporophyte, through the process of mitosis. And then eventually we'll have a fully developed a mature sporophyte individual for a fern, and thus the process will repeat. Okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about adaptations and uses for ferns and what they're most known for. So ferns are most often found in moist environments because the small water-dependent gametophyte, which last, lacks that vascular tissue, is separate from the sporophyte. Also, that flagellated sperm requires an outside source of moisture in which to swim to the eggs. Once established, some ferns, such as the bracken fern, can spread into drier areas because of their rhizomes, which grow horizontally in the soil, and from there the, uh, it'll produce new plants uh, in a horizontal manner. <coughs> So ferns and other seedless vascular plants we have dis been discussing were, a l were as large as trees and more abundant during the Carboniferous period, when a great swamp forest encompassed what is now northern Europe, the Ukraine, and the Appalachian Mountains of the United States. A large number of these plants died because, but did not decompose completely. Instead, they were compressed to form the coal that we still mine and burn today. Therefore, seedless vascular plants are sometimes called the coal age plants. And another thing that you can think about is oil, because oil has a similar origin, but it is most likely formed in marine sedimentary rock and includes animal remains. So that's where, where our coal comes from, is from this um, Carnif carboniferous period when the dominant plant life was going to be your ferns and lycophytes. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about our seed plants now. So seed plants are the most plentiful land plants in the biosphere today. Most trees, bushes, and garden plants are seed plants. The, ma the major parts of a seed are shown here in this particular diagram. The seed coat on the outer layer and the stored food inside protects the sporophyte embryo and allows it to survive harsh conditions during a period of dormancy or arrested state until environmental conditions become favorable for growth. Seeds can remain dormant for hundreds of years. When a seed germinates, the stored food is a source of nutrients for the growing seedling. This evolutionary adaptation has contributed to the success of the seed plants. In fact, most of the plant species on the planet are seed plants. So seed plants have two types of spores that produce two types of microscopic gametophytes, male and female. The male gametophyte is the pollen grain and produces sperm. The female gametophyte is the ovule, which contains the egg. Pollination occurs when the pollen lands on the female reproductive structure. The pollen will grow a pollen tube and the sperm migrates towards the egg. This represents a major adaptation to the land environment because the sperm does not need water to swim to the egg. Fertilization occurs when the sperm reaches the egg and they combine to form a diploid zygote. The zygote eventually becomes the embryo and the ovule becomes the seed. When the seed germinates, the embryo will become the new sporophyte generation. 
In gymnosperms, the seeds remain naked and lie within the grooves of cones. In angiosperms, the seeds are covered and can be found inside of fruits. So here we have a depiction of the steps that occur in the production of a seed. Okay. So in the first step, which is highlighted here, we're going to have the development of the gametophytes. And that they are going to begin in the microspore for males and the megaspore for females. Okay. And then in step B, we're going to have the process of meiosis. And that my process of meiosis is going to produce haploid megaspores and microspores. Okay, so in this case, in the female tissue, it's going to be a haploid megaspore, and in the male tissue, it's going to be a haploid microspore. Okay, so the pollen grain is going to be the microspore, and it is going to get carried to the vicinity of the ovule during pollination. So that's this step here. And then the pollen grain is going to germinate and a non-flagellated sperm is going to travel in a pollen tube to the egg to produce, uh, to the egg that is produced by the female gametophyte, okay? So that's what's gonna happen here. So the sperm is traveling down the pollen tube. And then following fertilization, the zygote becomes the sporophyte embryo, which is the tissue within the ovule that is going to become the stored food. And the ovule wall is going to become the seed coat. And then eventually we will have a fully developed seed with the embryo inside, surrounded by its nutrients, and then further surrounded by the seed coat. OK. OK, so let's continue our discussion of seed plants, but we're going to focus primarily on gymnosperms. So the term gymnosperm means naked seed. In gymnosperms, the ovules and seeds are exposed on the surface of a cone scale, which is simply a modified leaf. Ancient gymnosperms include cicadas and were present in the swamp forest of the Carboniferous period. The conifers are gymnosperms that have become a dominant plant group. So here is an image of a uh, cicadas. Cicadas are an um, ancient group of gymnosperms that are threatened today because they grow very slowly. And they are a typical landscape plant in tropical climates. All right, so let's focus our attention specifically on conifers now. So pines, spruces, firs, cedars, hemlocks, redwoods, and cypresses are all what we call conifers. The name conifer uh, signifies that the plants are going to bear cones, and the cones contain the reproductive structures of the plants. But other types of gymnosperms are also cone-bearing as well. The coastal redwood, which is a conifer native to the northwestern California and southwestern Oregon, is the tallest living vascular plant. It can attain heights of nearly 100 meters. Another conifer, the bristlecone pine of the White Mountains of California, is the oldest living tree. One living specimen is over 4,500 years old. And there is evidence that some bristlecone pines have lived as long as 4,900 years. So in this picture here, we have an example of pine trees, and they are the most common of the conifers. Here is a depiction of the pollen cones, and the pollen cones are much smaller than the seed cones depicted here. And the pollen cones are responsible for producing lots and lots of pollen. And a cluster of pollen cones may produce more than a million pollen grains. We have some other examples here. And he, 
this image, we have the spruces, which make up our uh, many Christmas trees that end up in a lot of people's houses. And then over here, we have an example of a juniper, which possesses fleshy, fleshy seed cones, which are seen in this image here. All right, so before we move on, I do want to touch on some adaptations and uses of pine trees. So pine trees are well adapted for dry conditions. For instance, vast areas of northern temperate regions are covered in evergreen coniferous forests. The tough needle-like leaves of pines conserve water because they have a thick cuticle and um, receded stom stomata. This type of leaf helps them live in areas where frozen topsoil makes it difficult for the roots to, to obtain plentiful water. A substance called resin protects leaves and other parts of pine trees from insects and fungal attacks. The resin of certain pines is harvested. The liquid portion called the turpentine is a paint thinner, while the solid portion is used on stringed instruments. The wood of pines is used ex extensively in construction, and vast forests of pines are planted specifically for this purpose. The wood consists primarily of xylem tissue that lacks some of the more rigid cell types found in flowering trees. Therefore, it is considered a soft rather than a hard wood. Okay, so let's go ahead and focus on our flowering plants now. So angiosperms, where the name means covered seeds, are exceptionally large and successful group of land plants. With over 270,000 known species, which is six times the number of species of all the other plant groups combined. Angiosperms, again also called flowering plants, live in all sorts of habitats, from freshwater to deserts, and from the frigid north to the humid tropics. They range in size from the tiny, almost microscopic duckweed to trees over 35 meters tall. Most garden plants produce flowers and therefore are angiosperms. In northern climates, the trees that lose their leaves are flowering plants. In subtropical and tropical climates, flowering plants, as well as gymnosperms, tend to keep their leaves all year. Although the first fossils of angiosperms are no older than about 135 million years ago, the angiosperms probably arose much earlier. Indirect evidence suggests that the possible ancestors of angiosperms may have originated as far back as 160 million years ago. To help solve the mystery of their origin, botanists have turned to DNA comparisons to find a living plant that is most closely related to the first angiosperms. Their data points to Amberilla tricopoda as having the oldest lineage among today's angiosperms. This shrub, which has small cream-colored flowers, lives only on the island of New Caledonia and the South Pacific. And that is our a depiction of Ambrilla trichotropodia. Okay, so let's focus our attention on the flower itself. So most flowers have certain parts in common, despite their dissimilar appearance. The flower parts called sepals, petals, stamens, and carpels occur in whorls or circles. The sepals protect the flower buds before it even opens, and the sepals may drop off or may be colored like the petals. Usually, however, sepals are green and remain in place. The petals, collectively called the uh, corolla, are quite diverse in size, shape, and color. The petals often attract a particular pollinator. Each stamen consists of a stalk called the filament and an anther, where pollen is produced in pollen sacs. 
In most flowers, the anther is posi positioned where the pollen can be carried away by wind or a pollinator. One or more carpels are at the center of the flower. A carpel has three major regions, the ovary, the style, and the stigma. The swollen base is the ovary, which contains from 1 to 100 of the ovules. The style is what elevates the stigma, and the stigma is that sticky end that is adapted for reception of the pollen grain. Glands located in the region of the ovary produce nectar, which is a nutrient that is gathered by pollinators as they go from flower to flower. So here in this image, we have the general structures usually present in the flower. So at the base of the flower or the outermost whorl, you're going to have your sepals. And again, the sepals are responsible for protecting the developing bud as the flower develops, and they usually stay at the base once the flower opens up. Sometimes the sepals fall off, sometimes the sepals are the same color as the petals, but majority of the time you can see the sepals as a separate green structure. So the next whorl is going to be your petals, okay? And the petals are usually the whorl that is most modified to attract pollinators. Uh, they are typically modified in shape, color, and smell to attract a particular pollinator so that the flower can be pollinated. The next whorl is going to be a whorl of stamens, and the stamens are the um, pollen producing portion of the flower. There are two main parts to, of note for the stamen and that is going to be the anther which is this, this bulbous end and then the filament that holds up the anther. And then usually the centermost whorl is going to be the carpal or carpels. The carpel is made up of several parts as well um, and this is the female portion of the flower and the carpel is made up of the bulbous ovary, the style, and the stigma. And the stigma is the sticky end that receives the pollen, and the style connects the stigma to the ovary, as well as elevates the stigma. Within the ovary, you're going to have many ovules, and that is where the female megaspore is produced. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the flowering plant life cycle. So in angiosperms, the flower produces seeds enclosed by fruit. The ovary of a carpel contains several ovules, and each of these eventually holds an egg-bearing female gametophyte called an embryo sac. During pollination, a pollen grain is transported by various means from the anther of a stamen to the stigma of a carpel, where it germinates. The pollen tube carries the two sperm into a small opening of an ovule. During double fertilization, one sperm is going to unite with an egg nucleus, forming a diploid zygote, and the other sperm is going to unite with two other nuclei, and it's going to form a triploid 3N endosperm. In angiosperms, the endosperm is the stored food. Ultimately, the ovule becomes a seed that contains a sporophyte embryo. In some seeds, the endospore is absorbed by the seed leaves, where, as in other seeds, the endospore is digested as the seed germinates. When you open a peanut, the two halves are the seed leaves, essentially. And if you look closely, you will see the embryo between the seed leaves. A fruit is derived from an ovary and possibly accessory parts of the flower. And some fruits, such as apples, provide a fleshy covering for their seeds, and other fruits provide a dry covering, like peat pods or peanut shells. Okay, so here in this slide, we have a visual representation of the life cycle of flowering plants. So just to start, we can look at the mature uh, sporophyte flower. So this is the diploid state of the organism. So within the flower, we're going to have both 
er two areas where a spore is going to be produced. In the anther, which is located at the tip of a um, stamen, you're going to have those microspores that are being produced, and those microspores are going to eventually become the pollen grain. And then in the carpels of the flower, that is where we're going to have the megaspores being produced, and the megaspores are located in the ovules, which are inside of the ovary. Okay. So these two paths here are showing the basic steps of the production of the microspore versus the megaspore. So the spores are both produced by the process of meiosis. So we go from a diploid state to a haploid state upon making these spores. And then once we finish that process, that microspore is going to become a pollen grain, which is right here. And the megaspore is going to become the embryo sac. Okay. And remember that the pollen grain is essentially a microscopic male gametophyte, and the embryo sac is a microscopic female gametophyte. Okay. And then once the pollen is released, it will eventually come in contact with the stigma. And then once it comes in contact with the stigma, it will germinate and form the pollen tube. And also, two sperm cells are going to be released and flow down the pollen tube. The pollen tube will extend all the way down to the egg inside of the ovary. Okay. So double fertilization takes place at this point. So one of the sperm is going to fertilize the egg itself, and that's going to create the embryo, and the others are going to fertilize the endospore, and that's going to become a tripole part of the seed, and the endospore is going to provide nutrients for the developing embryo. Okay, And so at the end of fertilization, we should end up with a couple of different parts of the seed. So the seed at this point is fully formed. So we're going to have the embryo, we're going to have the endosperm, excuse me, and then we're going to have that seed coat that is wrapped around both the endosperm and the embryo. All right, and then once the seed is developed, then that the ovary itself is going to become the fruit. And some fruits are fleshy and some fruits are hard. And that's the basic steps of the life cycle of a flowering plant. Okay, so let's move on and talk a little bit more specifically about adaptations of angiosperms. So successful completion of sexual reproduction in angiosperm requires the effective dispersal of both the pollen and then the seeds. Adaptations have resulted in various means of dispersal of pollens and seeds. When pollinated flowers are usually not showy, whereas many insect and bird pollinated flowers are very colorful. Night blooming flowers attract nocturnal mammals and insects, and these flowers are usually aromatic and white or cream colored. Although some flowers disperse their pollen by wind, many are adapted to attract specific pollinators, such as bees, wasps, flies, butterflies, moths, and even bats, which carry out particular, which, car uh, which carry only particular pollen, excuse me, from flower to flower. For example, bee pollinated flowers are usually blue or yellow and have ultraviolet shadings that lead the pollinator to the location of the nectar at the base of the flower. In turn, the mouth parts of bees are fused into a long tube that is able to obtain nectar from this location. Today, there are some 270,000 species of flowering plants and well over 1 million species of insects. Insects and the flowers they pollinate have co-evolved, that is, have become dependent on each other for survival. So here we have just a couple of visual representations of our pollinators. So this first image is showing a bee pollinated flower and it is typically colored 
that is not associated with being red because bees cannot really see red all that well. And then here we have butterfly pollinated flowers and they are wide to allow the butterfly to land on them. And then here we have a hummingbird pollinated flowers and which are curved back allowing the bird's beak to reach the nectar. And then in this example, we have a bat pollinated flower and they are large and sturdy and able to withstand rough treatment from the bat. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about fruits. So the fruits of flowers protect and aid in the dispersal of seeds. Dispersal occurs when seeds are transported by wind, gravity, water, and animals to another location. Fleshy fruits may be eaten by animals, which transport the seeds to a new location and then deposit them when they defecate. Because animals live in particular habitats and or have particular migrating patterns, they are apt to deliver the fruit enclosed seeds to a suitable location for seed germination, which is the initiation of growth and development of the plant. <clears throat> so in this image, we have the pea flower as well as the development of the uh, pea pod. So plants that have flowers must eventually develop into a fruit and the this is the pea pod flower itself. And then within the flower, you're eventually going to have the pea pod develop. Okay. And the ovules, which are located right here, will become the seeds. And the ovary, which surrounds the ovules, is what becomes the pod that holds the seed, uh, pea pods, essentially. Okay, so let's finish off with talking about the economic benefits of our plants. So one of the primary economic benefits of plants is the use of their fruits as food. Botanists use the term fruit in a much broader way than do the lay people. You will have no trouble recognizing an apple as a fruit, but a coconut is also a fruit as are grains, corns, wheats, and rice, and pods that contain beans or peas. Cotton is derived from the cotton ball, which is a fruit containing seeds with seed hairs that become textile fibers used to make clothes. Other economic benefits of plants include food and commercial products made from roots, stems, and leaves. So, Sweet potatoes, for example, are edible roots. White potatoes are the tubers of underground stems. And most furniture, paper, and rope is made from the wood of a tree bark, of a tree trunk, excuse me, or fibers from woody stems. Also, the many chemicals produced by plants make up 50% of all pharmaceuticals and various other types of products we can use. The cancer drug Taxol originally comes from the bark of the specific yew tree. Today, plants are even bioengineered to produce certain substances of interest. Indirectly, the economic benefits of land plants are often dependent on pollinators. Only if pollination occurs can these plants produce a fruit and propagate themselves. In recent years, the population of honeybees and other pollinators have been declining worldwide, particularly due to a parasitic mite, but partially because of the widespread use of pesticides. Consequently, some plants are endangered because they have lost their normal pollinators. Because of our dependence on flowering plants, we should be protecting our pollinators. Okay, so let us touch briefly on the ecological benefits of plants. So the ecological benefits of flowering plants are so important that we could not exist without them. Plants produce food for themselves and directly or indirectly for all other organisms in the biosphere. And all organisms that carry out cellular respiration use the oxygen that plants produce through photosynthesis. Forests are an important part of the water cycle and the carbon cycle. In particular, the roots of trees hold soil in place and absorb water, which returns to the atmosphere. 
Without these functions of trees and other plants, rainwater run out, runs off and contributes to flooding. Plant absorption of carbon dioxide lessens the amount in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere contributes to global warming because it and other gases trap heat near the surface of the earth. The burning of tropical rainforests is a double threat with respect to global warming because it adds carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and removes trees that otherwise would absorb carbon dioxide. And some plants can also be used to clean up toxic messes. <clears throat> for example, oh, for example, popular mustard and mulberry species take up lead, uranium, and other pollutants from the soil.